everyone, it's Pete here from the Pain Toolkit, and uh, hi to everyone. Thanks for tuning in, watching another Pain Toolkit interview. And uh, today I've uh, got a very, very good friend of mine called Blair Smith. He's up there in Bonnie, Scotland, and uh, Pete does a lot of important work up there, and he's, uh, I like to think, he's one of the, the knowledgeable guys in pain management. And uh, good afternoon to you, Blair. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks, Pete. It's good to see you. Thanks very much for taking part in uh, one of the Pain Toolkit interviews. Um, I thought, if, if, I don't want to, I know it's your day off and everything, I'm not going to go on too long, but I thought, um, I know you've been in pain management now for quite a few years. Um, I'll tell you what, why don't you introduce yourself to the viewers and say what you, you know, the, all the sort of things that, you, you, that you're involved in and we'll go from there. How does that sound? Okay. Um... So my name is Blair. I, my main job is as Professor of Population Health Science at the University of Dundee here in Scotland. Uh, but clinically, I work as a consultant in the pain service in NHS Tayside. Previously, I was a general practitioner. I worked in, as a GP for ooh, 20 years before moving into the pain clinic. I also work for the Scottish Government as the national lead clinician for chronic pain and with my colleagues in government and around the country. We're aiming to optimise and improve pain service provision across Scotland. Um, more, more recently, uh, I've had the privilege of working with the International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP, uh, uh, and I have the privilege of serving as co-chair of the new Global Alliance of Pain Patient Advocates, and I think that's part of what you're hoping to talk about today, or I may be wrong, but I think... No, I'm going to Hey Blair, I'm definitely going to talk about that because I want to learn a little bit more about it. I know it's an interesting concept, uh, project, etc. But um, no, I just want to sort of wind it back a little bit and uh, just ask you some questions on uh, on pain management, really, and uh, for coming from your background as a GP and now as a professor and stuff like that. I mean, uh, from when I uh, got involved doing this sort of stuff like 20 odd years ago, uh, from, from where it was to where it is now, it's to me it's like very captain kirk sort of stuff like you know where um pe you know people with pain wasn't really involved in anything um it was what are we going to do to you and stuff like that. so it's involved massively and um and i think we both know that and uh, and i think there's still that little bit of a gap between uh what healthcare professionals learn in med school or uh, schools that they attend physio school or whatnot there seems to still to be that gap about, uh, um, you know, what they learn in a, from a textbook to actually the practicalities of uh, supporting people with pain. Um, and I, I think that gap is going to be closed in, in time. But uh, I just thought before we go into the eyes, stuff, which is what I find is the really interesting stuff for our viewers today is, um, you know, put, putting on your, um, on your sort of forward thinking hat, where do you see uh, pain management <laughs> going forward in the future. Yeah, well, I think you're right. I'm going to wind you back a bit, actually. You mentioned, you said what uh, doctors learn in med school about pain, and the answer to that is, is almost zero. I think, honestly, the first uh, lesson I had in managing pain was my first day as a qualified doctor on the ward, 1st of August 1987, when uh, the nurse asked me to prescribe something for pain, and I hadn't a clue. I had to take her advice and prescribe coproximal as it was then. Uh, so really, there's a serious gap in pain education across all professions, uh, not just not just not just medical professionals, um, which we're trying to address, but it's taking a while. I think most of the education comes at postgraduate stages when you meet people with pain and with long-term pain, and you realise just a how common and important an issue persistent pain is and b how much of an impact it has on on the people that we're that we're working with and so yes i think when i first came in contact with the pain clinic it was almost exclusively staffed by anesthetists mm. and the reason it's staffed by anesthetists is because they're very good at getting needles into cavities and far off spaces in the body which was most of what pain management was about then injections and uh, and implants. 
Now, there's still a role for these things, but I think we're becoming much more aware of the need to look at other approaches to managing pain. You're obviously familiar, very familiar with self-management. Mm. Uh, we take what's called a biopsychosocial approach, which means that we need to understand the biology, but at least as importantly, understand how it affects the mind and the body and how it affects uh, the life that's being lived by the person in pain. And if we don't address all of these things, then we're not going to progress anywhere with, with management. So yeah. I think, uh, yes, you mentioned that uh, we've, we've learned a lot of that from, from speaking to and with uh, the people that we work with in, in the clinic and learning from people like yourselves in the pain toolkit and all the other initiatives that are going around across the world about the importance of a broad person-centered approach to managing pain. And I, I think that's, that's the way we're going and certainly the way we're trying to drive it in, in Scotland. Yeah, I think there's uh, lots of work to be done, and uh, but um, I think there's some good people in place now to do that, to drive the agenda forward, etc. So, Blair, let's um, let's talk about the, um, the the work that you're actually doing with IAS now, and uh, it's something I was involved with a couple of years ago uh, when they, they yeah, I mean, two years ago to actually have IAS um, inviting people with pain along to their their uh, global congress, etc. To, to be invited in the first place, I mean, that was a massive, massive shift because up until then, I, although I've been a member of IAS for, uh, I don't know, 10 years or so, yeah. never, I've been to several uh, global conferences, but uh, having patients involved and actually doing workshops, et cetera, was like, uh, that was really interstellar, interstellar stuff, you know, really quite shocking, uh, quite shock really, but, but, you know, so what, we moved, you know, we. We've actually moved forward now, and uh, so that meeting there was a few of us there. And um, but now, what I'm really pleased to hear is that there's, you know, where you've got this working group going on now. So can you sort of tell the viewers about, um, you know, the work or the what's your what the concepts of the group and how it's going to, you know, what's your plans for moving things forward, etc. Okay, well, I mean, first of all, it's it's amazing that it should be such a uh, dramatic thing to, to actually involve patients in talking about about pain that just shows us how, how far we still have to go that it's less than two years ago and that was seen as a major advance i mean the patient's voice is important in in all medical research and education and, and practice um, some medical disciplines are further ahead than pain in recognizing this some have still got a long way to go some countries are doing great work in uh, in patient advocacy in this field and some have uh, some way to go. I think it was um, the president of IASP, Lars Arendt Nielsen, who recognised that we had to catch up in the field of pain. And it was he, I think, who convened the, the group in Boston, which you attended in, in 2018, and which set up the, the, uh, the rudiments of what's now become the Pre IASP Presidential Task Force known as the Global Alliance of Pain Patient Advocates. And it, it, it's been given the goal of developing the partnership between IASP and patient advocates around the world. In um, Well, the, the vision of GAPA is to work together to improve the lives of people affected by pain through effective and equitable integration of the lived pain experience into all aspects of pain research but also management, education, and advocacy across the world and for all people. So it's not just in rich countries, it's in low and middle income countries. Mm -hmm. It's for people with pain, it's for people looking after people with pain, and it's for, for professionals trying to manage and, and advance the understanding of, of pain. You know, um, you know, a lot of people talk to me, you know, the pain talk, they just think it's like a, a UK thing and uh, it's, it's it probably was at the beginning, but it's as I've uh, over the years, it's well, as you know, the talk it's been translated into I think about 14 different languages. But when I uh, when I go to the um, when I go to I do a pre presentation teach at the European uh, Pain Federation uh, school in Austria in September, I've been going there for about I don't know, must <laughs> feels like forever, but about 10 years. Your holidays now? <laughs> oh yeah. 
it's a great it's a great venue. Uh, I'm always quite shocked, really. Um, our pain self management is really it's not even on people's agenda. And um, we're not talking about like, far away countries. We're talking about in uh, European countries. Is that uh, pain management still comes out of a needle or a tablet? Yeah. Uh, I'm always looking at uh, how. I'm always trying to look for ways on how to um, spread the spread the uh, the word, you know, like in South America, or Africa, and you know, countries that, that you know, especially with people that don't have access to stuff to pain self management or knowing, thinking that they always think what what the doctor is going to be doing to me all the time, and it's about getting people to be more more responsible. And um, I remember, I think early late last year, I did. Um, Emma Stokes, who's uh, she's a physio, I think she's president of the Physio Association or something, like a, like a global outfit. And uh, she invited me to talk to uh, some physio students there in Doha, in uh, Qatar. And, um, you know, and I thought it was such a fantastic experience because it's, they, they just wanted to hear about, you know, about a little bit about my story, but more importantly, how how I self-manage it, like, you know, so things, I mean, for that, that, that was a nice, fantastic experience, but, but also that now, that message is now being uh, given to, you know, to you know, people in North Africa, etc. you know. So what, what, when you, with this global thing, I, I know you've got, I can't remember how many people you've got attached to it in the, uh, in the network, yeah? is it about, looks about 20 from, from the list, I think, I'm not sure. I should know off the top of my head, it's somewhere between 20 and 25. What, one of the important features about the, the task force, um, 25 or so, is that it's evenly split between what we call traditional IAST members, so researchers, clinicians, academics, and people who have lived experience mm. of pain, and that's right from the top. So I'm co-chair. Uh, I'm very happy to be co-chairing with Gilletta Belton from the States, who yeah. is there as a person with lived experience. Very passionate, uh, has a lot to give and contribute uh, and in a very dedicated, intelligent way to the, to the world of, of pain and to, to us as professionals. And they're from every corner of the world. So we had a meeting by, uh, by Zoom, by a, a teleconference just last week, uh, at which there were 16 people attending from, uh, I, it was great to live in Scotland because it was four o'clock in the afternoon for me, but the, the earliest was, I think, half past six in the morning and right to, to Dunedin in uh, New Zealand, where it was almost the same time the next day, yeah. uh, so right from all across, all across the world. What, so, so what's the, um, I know you're meeting at the uh, Congress in Amsterdam um, in, uh, in August. Um, what, is, there like a, is there like an agenda you've got planned? Or I know, I know, you, I know you, you are a man of, ac a man of action. I know Joe is as well, Joe Letter. Joe Letter. Yeah. Uh, I know. I know. I know a couple of people were actually involved in the, uh, in the group. I know they're doers, like, and I don't want to get you know, get on and do stuff. But so, what's your what's your, what's your battle plan? Well, um, I suppose we're working on two fronts at, at the moment. The first is actually to to set up the structure and the governance of GAPA to find out what it looks like, how it can. Uh, exist and function effectively in partnership with IAS, but yet independent from IAS because that has implications for, for funding and the kind of activities and people that we can speak to. So there's a, a big stream of work uh, around that and it looks like we're going to set it up as something which in North America is called a, a foundation, which is a kind of charitable non-government organisation. But we've got a stream of quite a bit of work to do there. Uh, we've got to get that agreed by IAST along with the formal statement of our vision and mission. So that's all the, the kind of infrastructural things. But meanwhile, the other front is actually actually doing things, as you say. And the first priority is to actually do things at the next World Pain Congress, which is, as you know, in Amsterdam in, in August this, this year. So we have a number of exciting activities which are going to take place as part, some of them part of the core program, core scientific program of of World Pain Congress, and some of them is very strongly highlighted parts of a parallel program, giving insights into what it's like to live with pain in, in a very creative way, and sometimes in a discursive, discursive way, 
and there's an opportunity for people to contribute their own experiences of pain. Uh, we're going to try and we've got some strategies which are kind of longer term, but we can kick off with the World Pain Congress. So, for example, one of the important things is to be able to partner people with lived experience of pain with people who are researching pain so that they can uh, uh, get an insight into how they should be doing the research and planning and designing their research and then how to disseminate the research. And actually getting these people together can be quite a challenge so we can hopefully facilitate some of, some of that. Uh, and we can talk about other ways of getting the patient voice, the lived experience voice into uh, guideline development and um, education programs. And there's a, there's a stream of, of, um, of PR, I suppose, of marketing, of publication and, and webinars and uh, just things to, to make it to normalize um, the lived experience voice into, into the work of, of IAS. So we'll kick off at this pain congress. We've learned a lot about uh, how we actually got that going this time around. So we'll be, one of the things we'll be doing is evaluating the success of, of these events with a view to being even more embedded in the 2022 conference, which is in Toronto, which, who, where the scientific committee will be chaired by Ian Gilron, who's, who's part of the GAPA task force. So right from the start, we're, we're thinking kind of medium to long term as well as short term. Are you, is there any plans in the uh, often around education for um, how to, as you know, I'm into uh, getting the word out there, uh, educating people with pain and also healthcare professionals. Is there anything, I know it's all it's st step by step approach. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. there any, have you got anything in the, in the, in the, in the offing around um, promoting self-management uh, education to patients and doctors? Uh, yeah. uh, we've certainly been speaking about education as one of the main uh, streams of work when we're up and running. And it looks like, well, there's two, I think, two things, well, three things we've been speaking about. One is a series of publications on IASP or related websites. There's a, a website called Relief, where Joe and I have just submitted a, a kickoff publication to, to inform people about GAPA. But we can do education through webinars, and we have a number of potential topics and speakers for webinars that are aimed at either people living with pain or people researching and managing pain or both. Uh, so for example, people living with pain may, may be passionate and want to work with researchers but may not uh, have a great understanding of how the research process, funding, design, uh, etc. works. So there's some education to be done there. Equally, there's education for traditional researchers. Some are further ahead, some are more open than others, mm. but there, there's still education on how best the patient voice can and should inform the prioritization of research topics and the design, conduct, implementation of research and translating that into, into improving healthcare. And we can do things like podcasts as well, and interviews of, of the, the kind we're doing just now, I suppose, and, uh, and having them online in perpetuity or, or until they become outmoded. To me, I, I think doing this sort of stuff is, it's great to be uh, do in-person stuff, but I think with, uh, as we know, the planet, we, I, to me, I like doing this sort of stuff now because it's, it's saving time travel and uh, not time travel, but traveling. <laughs> Great, I love to do time travel. I'm not, I'm not, if I could time travel, I'd go back and keep my hair like, you know. But, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, about, to me, it's about being uh, a lot of traveling everywhere and whatnot. It, it, I don't know about you, I find it quite tiring these days, but I'm just an old fella now. But, you know, I think uh, it's practical, like, you know, and as you mentioned, you had that conference with all those lovely, lovely people who are involved. I mean, you know, what did it cost, you know, just go sitting in front of a screen, you know, just the cost of time rather than, the, the, you know, to getting people, you know, you know, the cost of getting people to con congresses, like, you know, it's phenomenal, isn't it? So... So long, as, so long as the technology challenges can be overcome, it worked very well indeed last last week and our first meeting, which was I think in October, we had similar. We have had one face-to-face -face meeting in Amsterdam in December mm. and I have to say that having met my colleagues in person, I uh, find it a lot easier yeah. to work with them and to, to meet them yeah. in the virtual environment. 
but we do we do have to be thinking about these things. Transmission of infection, of course, is a, another thing we have to be wary, wary about these days. So it's a low risk method. This morning, I, re, I was re, uh, re, uh, remembering when we first met, and it was one yep. of the, uh, the sort of European meeting, and uh, and I, I was in a we was in a queue waiting to go into the European Parliament. Um, okay. And uh, I was thinking, I was talking with uh, Pat Schofield, and uh, I sort of, she, I didn't know you at the time, and so I didn't know, uh, and you said, oh, well, I overdid it, and I, uh, I haven't had any breakfast. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I me, mean, I'm a bit, I always like, I, I just in case, I remember having a, I stashed a couple of croissants, uh, I blagged them from the, uh, from the hotel, and I said, we'll have one of these. <laughs> I was very grateful for it. I had uh, my um, alarm hadn't coped with the hours advance in time, so I was an hour behind by that time. Yeah, Do you remember the previous previous day in the Parliament where they left us oh, from nine o'clock to four o'clock without any lunch or even a drink of water? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I still love the EU and all. We, well, we, listen, man, don't get me stuck on that one. I'm uh, so bloody furious, but anyway, but uh, it is what it is. Hey, listen, I don't want to encroach on your day off, uh, Blair, and I really appreciate, um, you know, spending some time uh, to do the uh, interview with me today. And uh, I've learned a lot more today. And I'll tell you what, I just really wish you, I'm not going to wish you luck, uh, luck because I know that you and the rest of the dudes who are involved in the, um, in the uh, patient group, I'll tell you, I know you're going to do awesome stuff. And, um, and I just think, you know, people like Joe and uh, Keith, I know, and I think Mary from Australia, you know, these guys, you know, and all the other dudes, they're all like the, the next layer that are pushing things forward, like, you know, so. I know, well, great group. I know you're going to be great awesome. Group. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is one of the things we recognised when we were introducing ourselves to each other is that most of the people, many of the people who were there as patients have some uh, professional or other experience of the health services, and many of us who are there as researchers or professionals have the experience of, of pain and actually we, we've agreed that there, there mustn't be a, a them and an us in any of, of this work it's all us and it's a partnership and it's a great partnership to be part of and it, you know well you're listen man you're a footballer it's all about teamwork you know yes what yeah. position do you play by the way uh usually left back in the changing room <laughs> Well, whatever, yeah, left back, forward, striking, whatever. You know, you can't. You, you, everybody's got a bit to play on the on the on the pitch, and that's what it's about in pain management. It's, it's teamwork. You know, I can't do. I can do certain bits, but I can't do. You know, we all can't do all of it. So, so how do we work together as a team and have a fantastic partnership? But um, thanks very much for uh, doing the interview today, Blair. It's much nice to see you again, mate. And. Uh, and I dare say I'll see you again in uh, later on this year in Amsterdam, God willing. So I, yeah. hope, I hope that goes ahead and I hope we, we do that. I look forward to it. Thanks very much for your time just now. And I'll keep you and others up to date on GAPA online and through social media and, and so on. Sweet. Nice one. Thanks very much, Blair. And take care, man. Big, you big, too. My pleasure. Call and groovy, baby. <laughs>